Hi, I'm Ollie Hooper, a quantitative developer at QuantConnect, and this is Idea Streams, a weekly video series where we test an idea derived from current market trends by building a trading strategy on QuantConnect. In this week's Idea Streams, we're going to be investigating whether we can capitalise on the shock caused by a sudden increase in bond yields. So this was prompted by, there's been a lot in the news recently on bond yields being up and inflation fears. So this article on the FT caught my eye. It was talking about tech stocks dragging down the markets and it was relating it towards the 10-year treasury yield reaching a 14-month high. So let's head into a fresh algorithm. And firstly, we're going to be talking about um, time period and backtest period. So for a strategy that's going to capitalize on these kind of market movements based on bond yields, we're going to have to test it over a very long period. Now, QuantConnect data goes back to 1998, but we'd like to test a bit further back than that, and even further than when the SPY index, sorry, the SPY fund, ETF, was created. So I've got a data set that goes back to 1970, on the S&P 500 index, and I'm going to show you how you can use this data set to trade the S&P 500 back to as however long you have data for it. So let's head into the documentation. We're going to go to algorithm reference, importing custom data, and head down to here. And here we can find a custom data class. So we're going to take this class, and we're gonna paste it in at the bottom here, I'm going to call this data SPX. Okay, so this is going to be S&P 500 index data. I've got the source here. And we've got to remember is for Dropbox links in particular, it will say DL equals zero. You want to change this to DL equals one. And here we're going to say SPX equals SPX spx.symbol, spx.time. So the data is formatted as the time as the first column and the value as the second column. So we don't need these two ones here. We just need spx and that's going to be one instead. Also, the data is formatted as the day, then the month, then the year. And we're going to add on a time delta of one day to make sure we don't have any look ahead bias. There you go, and then just return SPX. So here we've got our S&P 500 index data. Great, let's see how we can actually use it now to invest in the S&P 500 index all the way back to 1970. So we're going to do self.add data And it's going to be SPX, our class SPX. We're going to give this a symbol of SPX and it's going to be at daily resolution. There we go. Let's take that symbol and let's save it as self.SPX so that we can use this symbol later. Okay, in on data, very simple what we're going to do. We're just going to be simulating holding the S&P 500 index. So we're going to use this if not self.portfolio.invested. What this does is it prevents you from over trading. So you are just going to invest in it once. And we're going to set our holdings to self.spx. Okay, let's set our start date to 1970, the 1st of January. Okay, and just before we run a back test, we just want to make sure that we have imported decimal. So down here at the bottom where it does decimal.decimal, let's just make sure that it is imported at the top. So let's run a back test and see what will happen if we had put in $100,000 into the S&P 500 index back in 1970. Okay, great. So we can see that our back test has successfully run using our custom data to simulate investing in the S&P 500. And we can see that at the end of it, we would have $4.2 million. So keep that number in mind, as that's the benchmark that we're going to try and beat with our strategy. So we've got this basic template here for using this custom S&P 500 data. 
let's make a copy of this and start introducing some 10 year bond yield data. So let's clone this project. And now I'm just going to quickly show you where I got this data from. So I got this from FRED, which is the Federal Reserve Economic Data website. And it's got plenty of data on monetary items like bond yield uh, and inflation indices, etc. So you can see this one actually goes back to 1962. So you can download that data into a CSV, upload it to Dropbox, and then take it into your algorithm. So we are going to create another data class. So we can just copy this one. And this one we're going to call, I'm just going to call this yield 10 year. Okay, so this is the 10 year constant maturity year. Constant maturity rate. 10 year treasury constant maturity rate. Great. And I've got the link here. So let's drop that in. Great. And so all we're going to do here, you can take that yield 10 year. Let's just call this yield. Oh, no, sorry, we can't. Let's call it yield 10 year. Okay, paste all that in. It's in the same order as before with the date and then the time. Okay, and just like that, we've got our yield data into our algorithm. So we can do self dot yield 10 year equals self dot add data yield 10 year. And let's just call this yield just to be simple there and resolution dot daily and take the symbol. Great. So now we've added in our yield data. So the way that the strategy is going to work is we're going to be tracking the 10 year yield over the past 90 days and seeing whether there's been a movement of more than two and a half standard deviations above the average. So if the yield has increased by two and a half standard deviations of the past 90 days above the past 90 day mean, so a simple moving average, then that's when we're going to come out of the market as we expect there to be a shock from this sudden increase in bond yields. And thus, by coming out of the market, we're avoiding a potential downturn caused by this shock and we'll re-enter when, when this yield value comes back within our range. Okay, so let's just create our yield average, which is going to be an indicator, and we can find these indicators in the documentation. Go to algorithm reference, and then indicators, we can just search up SMA and there we go. We can see all we have to do is put in the symbol, period and resolution. So self.SMA and self.yield 10 year. The And we said the period, so it's going to be, let's, let's actually define the period as a variable. So self.period. Let's put self dot period here equals 90. And then resolution dot daily. Okay, so we've got the average. Now we're gonna do the same for the standard deviation. So just put an STD. And yep, we can see it's the same symbol, period, and then the resolution. So let's call this STD. And put STD there as well. That's that. And let's have this threshold value. So we said two and a half times the standard deviation. Let's turn that into an attribute. So self dot thresh, and let's call this 2.5. Great. So let's head into on data now and let's start putting in some of the logic for our strategy. So first let's just check that the, that this data object here contains our yield data. So if not data dot contains key self dot yield 10 year, then we just want to return. We don't want to action upon this. Okay, now we're going to create our yield threshold value. So the value that if our yield is above that, then we want to come out of the market. So let's create our yield thresh, which will be our yield average, so the current value of our yield average, so current dot value, 
plus threshold amount, which is two and a half times our yield standard deviation and the current value of that. So that's our threshold value. And let's just, to make it easy, let's create get our yield value is equal to data self.yield 10 year dot value. Great, so we've got our values here. Now it's gonna be a simple if statement. If yield value is greater than yield thresh, then we want to come out of the market. So self.set holdings, self.svx, zero. Okay, and if that's not the case, then we're going to have this in here. So again, just to reiterate the reason, it's not just an else statement. The reason is elif, not self.portfolio.invested, is to prevent overtrading. So if we keep on telling the algorithm to set our holdings to one, there could be a point where we're buying and selling small tidbits just to make the difference, which will rack up a load of fees. And although using this custom data, when we haven't modeled slippage and fees, you still got to take that in mind. That's a very key point to take in mind when using custom data as a stock or a security. Great, so in theory, this should work. One thing that we need to make sure first though, is that we have a starting date of 1970, but we've got a period of 90 days. So we want to set a warm up period to begin with as well. So self dot set warm up equals self dot period. Another thing that we would like to do is to plot these yield values. And so we can see when it crosses over the threshold and make sure that our algorithm is working as expected. So simply to do that, we can say that we want to plot this every month. So self.month equals num. Okay, so this self.month, we're setting it to num to begin with. But if self.time if the current month is not equal to self.month, then we're going to sell, set self.month to equal to the current month. So what this basically means is this section here, this after this if statement, will only get executed every month. Because to begin with, none is not equal to January. And so the month will be set to January. But then the next day long, so the 2nd of January, January is equal to January, therefore this code won't get executed. So what this allows us to do is to plot the values every month. As we're running a 50 year back test, we don't want to be plotting the values every single day as that's, uh, as there are limits on the amount of data that you can plot uh, on the charts. So to plot this, what we can do is we can do self.plot, then the name of the chart. So let's just call this yield and then our actual data value. So yield threshold. So it's yield, uh, we can just call this threshold and give it yield thresh. Copy that. This one is the actual value. And let's create another chart to see the difference. So yield difference. And this can be yield yield value minus yield threshold. Okay, so we're gonna have two extra pots here. Just a small thing here, that is a method, not a variable. Also, I forgot to change this value here to be yield value, not yield threshold. So let's click backtest. So there we go, you can see that our backtest has finished and good news, it looks like our strategy has performed better than the benchmark over the past 50 years. So if we just compare a few of the numbers, so I've got the original just staying in the S&P 500 for 50 years here, and we can see that if we have a look at the numbers, we have a sharp ratio of 0.536 and an annual return of 7.5%, compared to a better sharp ratio of 0.6 and an average annual return of 8.55%. So we can see that our strategy, it looks like it is working how we expected it to. So capitalizing on the fact that there may be a shock in the market and we come out and avoid that downturn. We can see that the total amount of trades as well is 229. So it's getting a good amount of trades over this 50 year period. 
So if we have a look at these charts, we can see that this dark blue line is the actual value and the light blue line is threshold. So studying it closer, we can see the difference here. We've got a peak uh, in where it goes. Where it goes above zero is the period that we're going to be out of the market. So around between February and March in 1994, we can see that it crosses over and therefore we expect that we're going to be out of the market at this point. So we can check our orders and let's actually look for the first time it happens. So let's look in 1972, the 25th of August. So let's head over to 1972, should be near the start. And yep, we can see that it crosses over. So this period here, we're going to be out of the market and that works as we expected it to. Great, so let's just have a look at that all together. So, interesting question is, where is the current value now? So, as of this data, so we can see that as of the 1st of March, so at the beginning of this month, we have already crossed over. So we would have actually been out of the market when that Financial Times article came out talking about the tech stocks crashing 4% in the Nasdaq index. Very interesting to see. Also, another point that I just wanted to note was the reasoning behind choosing using the standard deviation above the mean rather than using a proportional increase in the yield. This was so that we weren't using an arbitrary number like 20% increase in the yield value over the past 90 days and instead using a more statistically robust indicator such as two and a half times the standard deviation above the mean. Because if you look at nowadays, the yield figure is in single digits. And so a true 1% increase in that yield value is nowadays a 70% and 100% proportional increase in the value. Whereas back 50 years ago, if it's in double digits, it's more like a 10% or 5% increase. And nowadays with the yields being so low, these movements are happening a lot more proportionally larger than beforehand. So using standard deviations above the average is a lot better way to craft this indicator. And we can see that, it, that it's worked in the fact that this backtest has produced a positive, statistically significant increase in our portfolio. So with all that in mind, I hope you now have a better idea of using custom data to create your own security. So we used that S&P 500 data that went back to 1970. If we had data that went back to the 19, back to 1900, we could use that as well. And also we were using the yield data as well, which we got off the Federal Reserve Economic Data website. We also looked at creating a simple moving average indicator and a standard deviation indicator and using those as a leading indicator to come out of the market and then back in when they came back into our threshold. Also, at the very end, we looked at producing charts and a very simple way we could visualize that our algorithm was operating as we expected it to. If you'd like clarification on any of these points or have any general questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. Both the team here at Quant Connect as well as the whole Quant community are valuable resources. And until next time, happy coding. Thank you.